I'm just uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm just enjoying seeing everyone's face. It's nice to see the church so full this morning. It's a real blessing, and we are all blessed that you're here uh, this morning. Amen. It's always good when the family comes together. Can I have the slide up, please? Let's just uh, commit this time to the Lord. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for who you are in our lives. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We acknowledge your presence here. We know, Lord, that you were here way before any one of us stepped into this church. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in our life and the life of the church, Father God. Father, this morning, even as we hear the word, Lord, we ask that each one of us will hear your sweet whisper to each one of us in your own special way. Lord, we just want to know what you are saying to each one. Lord, that we can take it home and Lord, that we can begin to put it to use in our own lives, Father. Lord, that, uh, that we will continue to grow closer, move closer, and be intimate with you. Lord, we're so grateful for the joy, the peace, the love that reigns in this house. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the title of my message this morning is A Generous Spirit. Um, let me see if this is working. Okay. As uh, Esther mentioned, today is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of the Holy Week in the Christian calendar. So it starts today and ends with Resurrection Sunday next, uh, next Sunday. So next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. So uh, as you may remember, Palm Sunday is when Jesus uh, rode into uh, Jerusalem on a, on a donkey, on a donkey's colt. Right, and you know when when the Lord was coming into Jerusalem that day, he knew exactly what's going to happen. Right, he had already prophesied about it, even though the disciples didn't quite understand what he was saying, because they were expecting a whole different outcome. But he knew exactly what was going to happen, and he chose to walk that path. Right, so that, that's Palm Sunday, and of course, uh, you know, this week, the Holy Week, I think it's an opportunity for all of us to meditate on what the Lord has done for us to purchase our salvation, right? You know, we know the, we know the, the gospel, we know all those things, but it's, I think it is important for us to spend time to meditate on what the Lord has done for us. And uh, I think the divine exchange is a perfect way to look at what the Lord has done for us, right? And, um, you know, in the divine exchange, you, I didn't write the whole thing down, I just put two lines. You know, the first one says, Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven. Jesus was wounded that we might be healed. And it goes on. And um, I know Pastor Sam has already explained or clarified, you know, why we use the word might. Because there have been questions about the word might. Might sounds like maybe, right? But might does not mean maybe. So when it says Jesus was punished, it's not saying that when Jesus was punished, I hope maybe by some chance I'll be forgiven. No, it's not what it says. The word might you know, I remember uh, Pastor Sam had a discussion about it. He was even considering why not put it as, when Jesus was punished, I was forgiven. Or I have been forgiven. Jesus was wounded that I have been healed. But yet, he came back to the word might. And it's very important. This word might, it doesn't talk about Maybe it talks about possible, possibility, or it is available. What does this mean? Everything that has been promised is available to us. 
it is possible. But we have a part to play. See, we need to appropriate that by faith into our lives. It's true that we are healed. Jesus, you know, was wounded that we might be healed. But if you don't believe it, and if you don't take hold of it and appropriate it, bring it into your life, you're not going to see it happen. So we need to believe, right? And all the promises are ours, but we must appropriate or seize it by faith. It doesn't work without faith. We need to believe and we need to have faith that it is true. The truth is true, but it's a matter of whether we believe it or not. You know? I remember I've shared this testimony many times before. You know, um, we were at a, a healing rally. And at this healing rally, the man in the front, who the preacher, and you know, I was saying, there are a lot of sick people uh, from a lot of unbelievers, a lot of really sick people. You know, some with uh, even mental issues were there, some with all kinds of uh, physical deformities. And the man said, no, if you believe, I'm going to pray now, if you believe, you're going to be healed. Do you believe? And everybody shouted, yes, we believe. You know, and I was, remember, I was next to this family. I don't know where they came from, but the, the daughter was severely disabled. And then they all said, yes, we believe. We believe. And then he prayed. And he said, no, if you believe, you'll be healed. And after he prayed, many were healed. But many who put up their hands and said, I believe, didn't get healed. And at that point, I asked myself, they were so sure they believed, yet they're not healed. And I asked myself, do I really believe that I am saved? I can say I believe, I believe, but am I saved? That was the question that came up in my heart. And immediately, the Holy Spirit reminded me, it was so clear. He said, every time a preacher calls people out for salvation, there's this battle going on in your heart. Shall I go? Shall I get saved? You know? But this time, did you feel it? And I say, yeah, there was absolute peace. When he said, no, do you need to be saved? No, do you, have you, do you know Jesus? Come up. There was no battle in my heart. There was no like, should I go? There was just absolute peace. I knew I was saved. And that kind of reinforced to me that I do believe. Right? So, all the promises of God must be appropriated by faith. And I want to just look at just one part of the um, divine exchange this morning. It says, Jesus endured our poverty that we might receive his abundance, allowing us to express a generous spirit towards others. What is a generous spirit? Is it something we pursue? Is it something that we go after? The world goes after a spirit of generosity. But you and I have a generous spirit. We are not pursuing a spirit of generosity. You know, in the book of Daniel, one of the ways they characterize Daniel is, Daniel is a man with an excellent spirit. He didn't say Daniel has a spirit of excellence. He wasn't pursuing excellence. It was in him. You and I, because we have the spirit of God in us, we have a generous spirit. We don't have to pursue it. It's already in us. Why? Because the Bible says God is love. And love expresses itself through generosity. Love always gives. Love is always focused on what is good for the others. It's not focused on personal gain. So basically, 
the spirit of generosity is not the same as a generous spirit. And our default setting is generosity. So if we are not generous, actually we are fighting against who we really are. Because we are made generous. Because the Spirit of God is in us. Now what is generosity? This is sort of the definition I found in I don't know which dictionary. It says, a warm-hearted readiness to give. Something that comes from the heart. The warm-hearted readiness to give. And then it also says, giving freely and unstintingly. I have never heard this word before in my life. I actually checked it out in the dictionary. Okay, Giving freely and unstintingly. That stintingly means not restricting or holding back. You know? That means giving. There's no... There's no, nothing holding you back. You're just giving freely. That's what generosity means. It's coming from a warm-hearted readiness, ready at all times to give. Now, I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And let me just give you a little bit of background. As you can see on the map there, um, Corinth is right at the bottom there. That is Greece, huh? that part of it. And uh, Corinth at the bottom, it is in a province of the Roman Empire called Achaia. And just above Achaia is another province called Macedonia, right? Alexander the Great came from Macedonia. So that is Macedonia and of course the capital city there is Thessalonica. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the chapter before this, you will hear Paul tell the Corinthians about how wonderful the Macedonian church is, how generous they are, how they gave, you know, out of their lack, they gave, and he sings praises about the Macedonian church, okay? And why, he's, uh, why is he talking about this giving is because there's famine in Jerusalem, and the people of God there are struggling and suffering, and so he's uh, raising support to help the church in Jerusalem. And so in chapter 8, he talks about how wonderful the Macedonians are, you know, how much they gave and so forth. And then you come, come to chapter 9, and he says this, and you wonder like, actually what's going on here? Here he says, now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous, another big word, uh, means it is unnecessary, okay? It is superfluous for me to write to you. I think in today's English, the best word to uh, replace superfluous would be the, <laughs> you know, I don't need to tell you this, right? right? For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians. Earlier, one chapter earlier, saying, wow, the Macedonians, incredible givers, they gave out of their lack. Now he's talking to the Corinthian church and he says, you know, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonian church, that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal has stirred up the majority. And yet, I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect. That, as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, should be ashamed of the confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Strange letter, no? It almost sounds like he's being sarcastic. It almost sounds like he's prodding them. You know, it seems like hey, you guys, actually, in my, well, my understanding is, the, when he first told the Corinthian church about the need, 
in Jerusalem, they were all excited. Yeah, we must give. Let's do it. But now a year has passed. Suddenly, like, I don't know, you know. We got our own needs. You know, my child needs to go to university. You know, my business. So you can see the enthusiasm has come down. And so Paul has to do something to get them back to where they were. And so he's beginning to sort of instigate. He's saying, you know, those guys gave so much. You know, those guys, but I've been boasting to them about how great you are. You are even greater givers. Now don't embarrass me, please. You know, I boasted about you. And now I'm sending people ahead because I'm afraid if I come there and you fellas are not prepared, it's going to look bad. And so I'm sending some people ahead of me so that, you know, you guys get together, do whatever needs to be done. And then he ends there by saying, so that the gift is a matter of generosity. That means it's something that you want to do rather than I turn up and then you're all out of obligation. Alamak, Paul is here. Oh my God, you know, do something like just throw something. And send. He doesn't want you to do it grudgingly. He wants it to do out of generosity, right? So that's what's happening. And also, if the people in Corinth were really excited about giving, Paul wouldn't have written the rest of chapter 9. But you can clearly see he's trying to explain why you should give. And that's what we want to look at now. And this is what he says. We'll read right through the ninth chapter. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly of necessity, compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor his righteousness and yours forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. While through the proof of this ministry, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them and all men. And by their prayers for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So, Paul, after speaking to the Corinthian church, asking them to give, he's telling them why, you know, encouraging them to give. And verse 6, it says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This scripture has always troubled me because it sounds like you need to bribe God. You give more to God, God will give more to you. I've heard people preach and say, you know, you give to get. That doesn't sound like God to me because God is a God of love. He's not going to incite us to bring the lust and greed out. <laughs> You're right. And if it was this easy, you give more, you get more, we'll all give more. <laughs> right? So, I may be rubbing against some sacred cows, <laughs> but I just, I just want to look at this scripture differently. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Is God saying that you will be blessed when you give more? Is that what he's saying? Or is Paul speaking to a community who understands agriculture? Right? They're all farmers and, you know, 
So when Paul says, he who spares so sparingly will reap sparingly, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. As a farmer, if you have seed in your hand, you have a choice. You can decide to eat the seed, satisfy your immediate need, but then you don't have enough to sow for the next harvest. Or you can choose to forego some of the pleasures and things that you desire now and do what is right so that there's a harvest coming. And I believe this scripture, Paul is not trying to bring a new doctrine in. He's just saying there are times when we have to make the difficult decision and do what is right for the future. It's not about you give more, you get more, but it's talking about doing what is right for the moment. Sometimes you have to sacrifice instant gratification so that there's going to be a harvest. Right? And so, Paul says here, right? You know this principle. It works in reality. So then, he says, so let each one give, give as he purposes in his heart. Let each one. He didn't say, let the rich give. He didn't say, let the one who has excess give. He said, let each one. So it doesn't matter whether we are rich or poor, or we have more, or we have less, or we have excess, or we have lack. Paul says, each one, everyone, each one give. And then he says, give how? As he purposes in his heart. Most of us, when we give, we think about it, we consider, right? He didn't say what you decide in your mind. He said what you purpose in your heart. Why? Because every time there is a need or something comes to us, you know what we first do? The Spirit of God will speak to our heart about it. There's a prompting that comes in. And then what do we do most of the time? <laughs> then we start reasoning it out, right? Then we say, oh, yeah. You know, first I say, oh, yeah, yeah, I want, I want to give. Yeah, this is what God is saying. Then, but you know, oh, I got this expense or my roof needs to be repaired. What if my car breaks down? And then we, we'll, we'll reason it out to the point where either we don't give or we give less. And I must confess, I've done it many times. You know, when I hear something and I know something in my heart says I should give towards this. And I even know the amount I should give towards this. But the minute I start reasoning it out, it's just a matter of time, I'll either miss the opportunity or I'll give a lot less and regret it just after giving. After giving, I say, that's not what I should have given. Because, why? Because God is saying, you know, do what he has purposed in your heart. And I can tell you this, most of the time, the first prompting you get is from the Holy Spirit. Most of the time. After that, we start reasoning it out. And then it all gets diluted. That doesn't mean that we don't use the wisdom that God has given. It doesn't mean that we don't pray. But you realize that first prompting, keep it right there in front of you and ask God, Lord, is this you? And so that's what it's saying here. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. What is it that the Holy Spirit has already put in your heart? What is it that is prompting you? And then he says, don't do it grudgingly or out of compulsion, right? When God gives us an unction to do something, if you really don't want to do it, don't do it. Don't do it grudgingly. Don't do it grumbling, complaining, you know. Sometimes God may say, you know, give something to someone, and I've done this before, you know, I'm going to give, and then I say, Oh, wow, this fellow's handphone is so much more better than mine. Why am I giving money to this person? <laughs> you know, right? You become grudging. You're giving it, but you're beginning to grudge. You're beginning to complain. 
but you don't know the need in that person's life and you don't know what God knows. And so, God says, you know what? Don't do it grudgingly. Don't do it out of compulsion. Don't make people manipulate you, force you, make you feel so bad that you have to give. That's not God's way. Because God says, love always gives. And so he says this, for God loves a cheerful giver. I asked my wife last night, so does that mean God hates uncheerful givers? <laughs> right? If God loves a cheerful giver, what does it mean? It just means that it delights God's heart when we give what he has prompted us to do because our heart is aligning to his heart. That delights God's heart because he prompted you to do something and you're doing it. You want to please the Father. You're excited that he's given you the opportunity and it delights his heart. It's not that he's going to love you or not love you based on your giving because the Bible says he loves you unconditionally. So whether you give or not, love is not a question. It's done. But what he delights is when our heart begins to align with his heart, when we begin to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit, that's a cheerful giver. And then it says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Fantastic scripture, right? But what about the people in Jerusalem? Then didn't they, didn't they believe the same God? Why are they having a famine? And why are they suffering? And why does this scripture say God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work? Yet, the church in Jerusalem is struggling. There's a famine. And I remember uh, listening to a message once, and the preacher said this, and it kind of stuck with me because it was something that I never expected anyone to say. He said, do you know there's no money in heaven? I was like, what? Yeah, there's no money in heaven. All the money is on earth. It's in your hands and in your pockets. And how does God make all grace abound towards you that you always have the, all the sufficiency? The church in Macedonia the church in Achaia was the way God made his grace abound towards the church in Jerusalem. This word is true. But the blessing of God comes through his people. Have you ever seen money fall from heaven? I haven't yet. That'll be nice. Right? It doesn't. It comes through hands of people who love God. Whether you can say, of course, oh, I work, ma. I work, I get my salary. Yes, we get paid wages for what we do. But then the blessings of God comes through so many ways, and it's not always material. You know, we're always expecting, you know, I remember there's a time where people used to say, you know, if you give a car, you get a car. If you give a house, you get a house. Yes. Okay, I don't want to use language that's not right, but that is garbage. Okay, it's not how it works. Because our giving should be from love. Our giving is not based on what I can get. If the whole purpose of giving is that I want to get something, the motive is already wrong. We can do the right thing the wrong way. Oh, hang on, my iPad switched off. And so this is what God is saying. All the blessing that he has promised is going to come through our hands to others. And I'm not going to go through the whole of the rest of this chapter, but you realize in the next portion, he says, you know what? When you give, people are blessed. They will glorify God. They will thank God. The glory still goes to him. But where did the money come from? It came from you. 
you gave and He received the glory. He received the thanksgiving. And that's the harvest. There's someone, you know, some person who has ill-treated you or some group that speaks badly of you and we go out of our way to be a blessing to them, they will glorify God. They will recognize who our God is. They will recognize that God is a God of love. So, three-point sermon. So, why be generous or why give? The first reason is this. Love always expresses itself through generosity to others. If we say we love, naturally we will give because we want to be a blessing. It's natural. It's our default setting. We can't help it. We have the spirit of love who is the spirit of God dwelling in us. We're not pursuing him. He's already in us. Now another scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Allah ma. Okay, let me just clarify. Relatives here is not talking about all the relatives will go bankrupt. Okay, it's talking about immediate family. Okay, our parents, our siblings, our children. Okay, our household. So he says, anyone who does not provide for his own household has denied the faith is worse than an unbeliever. It sounds almost like we are insulting unbelievers. Because most unbelievers take care of their families, right? And they take good care of their families. So why, why say this? It's almost like, why did, why did Paul say this to Timothy? If anyone does not provide for their family, they are worse than an unbeliever. Very simple. The fact is, Paul is saying, most unbelievers take care of their family. Take care of their spouse, take care of their children, they do. But there's one difference between you and the unbeliever. The unbeliever doesn't have an indwelling spirit. Yet, he's taking care of his family. If you, who have the spirit of God in you, don't take care of your own family, then saying you're much worse than an unbeliever. Unbeliever without the Spirit of God is doing it. You, where the Holy Spirit is continually compelling you, continually leading you towards loving, it will take a lot of suppression of the Holy Spirit not to take care of your family. Now, one thing about this, when it says take care of your family, it's not talking about you don't have enough. It's talking about you have, but you don't take care of your family, right? If you're going through a hard time and can barely make ends meet, it, this scripture is not talking about that. But it's talking about, you know, I'm saying with the friends and say, next round on me, but the kid doesn't even have a shoe in the, to go to school with, right? That's something is wrong. Then you're worse than an unbeliever because unbelievers take care of their family. But you with the spirit of God are not doing it. That's why the scheme. So what does this scripture tell us? We also give because we have a responsibility to give. Some of our giving is out of responsibility to our family, to the government. We pay our taxes. That's our responsibility. We have a responsibility towards the community. We have a responsibility towards the church. You know, I was just thinking, when I was young, I mean, I went to church for years and years. I don't, we didn't have an air condition. We had a fan. I, but I don't remember complaining about the heat those days. Went to church every Sunday, happy. Maybe we were a kid, so I enjoyed going to church, meeting my friends. Today, if the air con didn't work, I can tell you <laughs> that we are revolt. We have to have a committee meeting to decide whether the service is going to be on or not. Right? We are so blessed. Right? We're so blessed. And all this costs money. So we have a responsibility to take care of the church. We have a responsibility to take care of all the expenses, the costs, whatever we want to do, we have a responsibility. It's part of our duty, right? And so that is also part of what we do as a, as a believer, we give. Now, I'm going to look at one more portion of scripture. Okay, 
before that. So another reason to give is because it's our responsibility. We can't run away from responsibility. That's why if you remember, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and said, you, you guys, you have twisted everything. You don't honor your father and mother, but you say, I give it to God. And then you don't care about your parents. That's wrong. Because we have a responsibility, right? Now, Genesis chapter 13, let me just go give you the background. Abraham and his nephew Lot. Okay, Abraham uh, left Ur of the Chaldeans with his father. They came to a place called Haran. And just so happens, Abraham has a brother called Haran, but different spelling, one is double R, one is single R. Anyway, the brother Haran died in Haran. Okay. And so, the brother's son Lot, when God called Abraham to go to Canaan, or rather to go, he brought his nephew along, Lot. Okay. Because he didn't have a father. So they, they went and one of the questions I ask is, was Abraham wealthy when he left Haran? There's no clear answer to that. But he does say, you know, he left with his family, his household, his... Oops, excuse me. Telling me it's time to stop? <laughs> okay. But we know that, you know, he brought flock, he brought his nephew, Lord, and they go and as they are going along, they are getting more and more wealthy, right? And eventually they go to Egypt and then Pharaoh also gives them a lot of uh, money and whatever else because, you know, they wanted to marry Sarah and it didn't happen and all those things. So they're rich, they're wealthy. Both Lot and Abraham are wealthy. And then, because they have a lot of flock, there is a, there is a dispute between Lot's people and Abraham's people, right? And so, Abraham tells Lot, you see this land before you? If you take the right, we need to split because we don't want to have any strife within the family. So, if you take the right, I'll take the left. If you take the left, I'll take the right. And so it starts here. And so Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan towards Zoar was well watered like the garden of the Lord. It's almost like Eden, okay? Like the land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. The two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. I'll just stop there for a minute. Think about this. You bring your nephew along, and most probably your nephew is successful because it is you who have raised him up. It is you who have given him the opportunity to grow and become wealthy, right? And now, they need to split up. And Abraham tells Lord, you choose first, which is, how many of us would do that? I'm the one who raised you up, okay? <laughs> you will have nothing without me. So, I'll take this land, you take that. That probably would be how most of us would do it, right? But Abraham tells Lot, you choose first. And the choice is very stark. One side is, it's Eden. Perfect plains. You know, it's easy to raise livestock here. Fantastic, perfect, awesome. The other side is not so great. In fact, a lot of it is desert land. And Abraham says to Lot, you choose and Lord chooses the best, of course, right? Chooses the plains, which is almost like Eden, well-watered, wonderful space. And Abraham says, okay, we'll do that. I'll take this part of it. Have you wondered why Abraham would do that? Why would Abraham be so generous? 
Life is going to be difficult on this side. Because this is almost like desert land, hilly, it's not great. While the other side, it just goes down to the, the sea, rivers, well watered. Perfect landscape for your flocks. But, but Abraham allows Lot to take it. What do you think he did that? Do you remember, just one chapter later, you know, the Lot gets captured and then Abraham and the kings go and they bring uh, Lot back and they plunder the land, everything, and then the king of Sodom tells uh, Abraham, you know, just give me the people, you take the plunder. And Abraham says, no, I will not take anything from you because I don't want you to claim that you made me rich. In other words, saying there's only one person who made me rich and that is God. That is why Abraham is able to stand there and tell Lord, you take whichever part you want because my source is God. It's not the well-watered plains of Jordan. You can take the best. God will take care of me because my source is God. And I want to encourage you. We live in a very strange time today, in this country even. You know, I hear so many complaints about certain groups of people doing certain things that are very unfair, is unjust and blah, 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 blah. It's, none of it is not true. A lot of it is true. But guess what? God is asking us, who is your source? People can take the well-watered plains of Jordan from you. God is your source. It's not the well-watered gardens. It's not the easy business. It's not this, that, or the other. And that's, that's one of the things that we really need to ask ourselves. Is God our source? You know, I can tell you this. I used to always pride myself as a good giver. I'm very generous, I used to think. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. I used to think that I'm very generous. And I used to give in every way possible. It was easy. You know, there were times when my bank, my bank account will go down to two digits. But then no issue. Because end of the month, salary will come. No issue giving. Very generous. No problem. Because there's more where that came from. Every month, there's more money coming. No issue. Then I quit working. Now it's not, it's not, it's not consistent. It's not the same amount. And then suddenly I begin to realize, maybe I'm not so generous after all. <laughs> I was very generous when there was ample and there was a street, steady flow, no problem being very generous. But then when you don't see the steady flow, I really ne needed to stop and recognize my own heart and say, am I really generous? Am I going to look at my bank account or a lack of it? Or am I going to say, God is my source and remain as generous as I was when I was getting a steady income? You know, that's a decision that I had to make. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to be as generous as ever I'm going to give. Now I'm almost 60. Now there's almost nothing coming in. <laughs> Whole different level. And again, as I was reading this portion of scripture about Abraham, God really convicted my heart. And he said, who is your source? It's so easy for us to look at our bank account, look at where everything's, you know, how it's going to come, who's going to give, you know, which investment's doing well or whatever it is. But let me tell you, all those things don't matter at all because it can disappear in a minute. 
In fact, we really don't know what's going on on the earth today. We really don't know. Everything can change at any time. Who is your source? Because if you know God is your source, then you don't have to fear lack. Because he will provide. Remember the scripture we saw earlier, you know, a man who doesn't provide for his own family is worse than an unbeliever. Guess what? God is a father. Don't you think this father will take care of his own household? Otherwise, he'll be worse than an unbeliever. It's not possible. No matter what the situation is, You know, people may be taking the best from us. It may be very unjust. It may be unfair. There may be discrimination. All kinds of things. But the fact is, a lot of people go through these things. In fact, in this country, I think we are very blessed compared to many other countries out there. But the bottom line is this. Are you sure who your source is? Because I can guarantee you, if you don't know who your source is, your life is going to be shaken. Because the world is really uncertain. So that is another reason why we give. The third reason. The third reason we give is because we want to declare that God is our source. When my bank account is low, I still want to give because God is my source. It's not my bank account. Right? I remember when, I, when we were in Bible school, one of the things that they used to teach us is, you know, when you're struggling or when you have a lack, sow a seed, give. And the giving is not so that, you know, by my giving, I'm going to receive something. My giving is a declaration that God is my source. So when I am in lack, that is the time we normally will hoard. That's the time we will give less. We will be afraid, fearing lack. That is the time we need to declare who our source is. It is our God. So it doesn't matter whether it's good times or bad times or difficult times. If God is our source, we will never stop being generous. We will always give. So I just want to end with this. Three simple points. You can't help yourself but to be generous. Because God's love is in you. Love always gives. The second thing is there are some things that we are responsible for and we should take care of it. And finally, every time we give, we recognize our source is God because if you don't believe your source is God, it's very difficult to give because we need ma. What about this bill, that bill? What about my future? What about my retirement? What about, there's a lot of things we need. But when we know God is our source, it doesn't matter if there's no monthly income We have a heavenly father who loves us. He will always provide for us. You know, I remember I'll end with this. I think I've shared this testimony before. Many years ago when I was a young engineer, um, performance review. So my boss called me into the room for a performance review. So went through everything. Then after that, he said, so how much do you want for an increment? So I said, it doesn't matter. Anything will do. Then he said, wow, you're so rich. uh. You don't need money. And without thinking, you know, it it didn't even cross my mind. I wasn't, just out of my mouth, I said, my God will supply all my needs. (laughs) He has supplied my need every day of my life. Because he's real. My God. And it came out of my spirit. (laughs) It didn't come. (laughs) It came out of my mouth and I'm surprised it came out of my mouth because this is an unbeliever talking to me. But God has been faithful. He has always taken care of us. It's just whether we choose to trust him and whether we choose to recognize that he alone is our source. 
no one else. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in our lives. Lord, we recognize even when we have been unfaithful, you have never stopped being faithful. Lord, forgive us, Father, when we complain, grumble, and murmur, and we forget to be grateful for all that you've done in our lives, all that you're doing. Father, we are so grateful that we have this confidence in us that gives us peace and puts us in a space of rest because we have a loving Father who will always provide for us. Lord, as a church this morning, Lord, we want to declare that you are our source. Lord, we look to you as our source and we remember that you have always been faithful in this church over the last 30 plus years. There has never been a day that we have lacked. And Lord, we continue to declare that you are our source. And Lord, that you are a good, good father. Lord, we just want to rest in that. Lord, we want to be cheerful givers, Father God, because we want our hearts to be so aligned with you, a heart that loves like you do. Lord, we just praise you, we just honor you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.